Hi, friends, and welcome to the Friends in Fiction show Behind the Book. With four New York Times bestselling authors and endless stories, I'm Mary Kay Andrews. And I'm Meg Walker. On behalf of Mary Kay's co-founders and co-hosts, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson-Harvey, and Patty Callahan-Henry, we are excited to welcome you to a special episode of Friends in Fiction Behind the Book, a quicker deep dive into the life and work of one of our favorite authors. And today we're so thrilled to welcome the New York Times bestselling mystery author, Sarah Peretsky. Sarah, Sarah is a, one of only four living writers to have received both the Grand Master Award from the Mystery Writers of America and the Cartier Diamond Dagger from the Crime Writers Association, which is, that's the British Crime Writers Association, I think. Hailed by the Washington Post as a definition of perfection in the mystery genre, Sarah introduced her fan favorite character, V.I. Warshawski, in 1982 in the novel Indemnity Only. Sarah is the creator of Sisters in Crime, and I'm a member, a worldwide organization to advocate for women crime writers. With a lifelong passion for social justice, Sarah's been an activist for women's rights, worked as a community organizer in Chicago during the 1966 race riots, advocated for mental health care for the homeless, mentored troubled teams, fought for reproductive rights, and helped build STEM and arts programs for young people. Sarah joins us today to discuss her brand new novel, Hey Dirt, in which V.I. Warshawski's unflinting courage is challenged um, in all sorts of ways. All right, Sarah. Well, welcome. We're so happy to have you. Thanks. Um, it's great to be here. Will you tell us uh, what Pay Dirt is about? And then one of our favorite questions here at Friends in Fiction, what is it really about? What is it really about? <laughs> Pay Dirt takes VI, who's a Chicagoan born and bred. Unlike me, I grew up in Kansas. In fact, I grew up in rural, I cannot say rural, rural Kansas. Um, but Pater takes VI out of Chicago, out of her comfort zone where she has friends and connections in both the police and the underworld to Lawrence, Kansas. She goes there. She's facing some terrible personal problems and some young active athlete, athlete friends of hers drag her down to see a women's basketball game. One of their friends disappears. They beg VI to stay and look for her. And suddenly VI finds herself really almost up to her nose in uh, literally and figuratively in the Kansas River in in coal factories and going head to head with some billionaires over crimes that she doesn't know anything about and has limited resources to solve. Yeah, you know, Sarah, you don't ever do it the easy way, do you? <laughs> <laughs> you... With VI, you created a female detective with the grit and the smarts to take on the mean streets, challenging a genre in which women were to traditionally cast as vamps or victims. Now, you've gone on to write nearly two dozen VI Warshawski novels. You know, she struck a chord with readers and critics. What do you think it is uh, about Vic? I call her Vic because I feel like I know her. <laughs> what is it about Vic that we all love so much? What keeps readers coming back for more? And what keeps you driving to the page to pen more of these novels? Thank you both for the compliment and for the, the question. I'm I'm grateful to readers who keep coming back. I have a Facebook page that I feel is kind of a community of, of readers and writers, because a lot of my writer friends are also there. And I feel like, like, I'm willing to have people be vulnerable, people in my books be vulnerable. VI is not a, she's not a Sherlock Holmes type of detective who always is one step ahead of where everyone around her is. She's often playing catch up. She deals with some of the issues that, that I've learned to deal with since my husband's death of, you know, loneliness, how hard it is to, even if you have a lot of friends to keep yourself going and, I sort of think it's her vulnerability as much as anything. You know, she's she's tough, she's gritty, she's all these things, and you know that she will never let you down if you're a friend and you're in trouble. But at the same time, she is tormented with doubts and her bones ache when <laughs> it's been a hard day. <laughs> and it, it maybe it's that, that that makes readers connect to her. Yeah. Now, how do you keep things fresh? And and here's the other question, because you've been doing this for 40 years. Here's another one. 
Has Vic mellowed any? <laughs> I don't know. You know, in some ways, I, I think she's less mellow. Uh, but I think that's in response to the times. Right. You know, I started, the year that my first book was published was the year after Sandra Day O'Connor became the first woman justice on the Supreme Court. It was the same year that women in Chicago were first allowed to be members of the regular police force. So we just felt like the world was opening up to us. Nothing was going to stop us. And yeah. having a woman private eye, just it, it felt natural. It felt like the next thing to do. But of course, there was a lot of pushback. And I saw that I was part of the first generation of women to enter corporate management in large numbers. And boy, the boys did not like us coming and playing in their sandbox. But um, <laughs> but so VI is making a, a big deal out of that in the first book. You know, she calls herself by her initials because uh, it's harder to be put down if someone, you know, her name is Victoria, but guys are going to call her Vicky, you know, a little girl name. And um, sorry, but um, so she insists that, it, that it's her initials. And one of one of the men says, what does the VI stand for? And, or what does the V stand for? And she says, my first name. So in some ways, you know, she had a lot of attitude, but she also had a lot of, I don't know, the kind of happy confidence that we all had, those of us who were young and starting out in those days. Now, I think we've been feeling decades of this pushback and mm. attack on our our bodies, our reproductive freedoms, all these things that we thought were were just settled. Out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so in some ways, VI is much, I would say, less mellow, more, more aggressive, more angry than than she would have been 40 years ago. Yeah, she does not hesitate to throw herself physically right into the fray. And I think that was one of the things. And, you know, but she says it hurts right? <laughs> when she's climbing <laughs> up yeah, she's right. doing a Spider-Man thing. And she's like, oh, my God, I hurt. <laughs> but, you know, if she sees someone else who's vulnerable, she is right there. Like yeah. one of the characters that I enjoyed creating who's really just a walk on in a way is this little boy whose mother has gotten her herself in over her own head she's got a, a child that she's trying to raise without a partner and uh, and vi just she just zeroes in on that and and she's very tender with the child and the mom and you know let's sort this out yeah timmy Love that. yeah timmy right <laughs> So, Sarah, we know that fictional characters often contain some of their author's uh, DNA. So let's talk about the similarities and differences between VI and you. Um, so like your fictional detective, you also have a golden retriever. You both share a love for strong coffee and red wine. And obviously, you both have a passion for social justice. So how much do you draw on your own life in creating this beloved character? And how are you the same and how are you different? I would say that VI, if if I was doing the things she was doing, I wouldn't be writing about her. She's the person who puts her her feet on the ground, so to speak, and I'm the person who thinks wistfully that, gosh, I wish I was brave enough to do X or Y or Z. So, um, and in some ways, gosh, uh, she... I think that she has some of my own fantasy life in her. Like <laughs> my my heritage is all the cold northern European countries, Holland and Lithuania, Poland. VI, she gets an Italian mother. She gets I mean, it's a stereotype, but of course there are artistic Poles and Lithuanians and Dutch and Germans, but but you think of Italy, you think of warmth and art and her mother uh who had a difficult life but she trained as as a singer and so vi has access to that that kind of heritage which i wished had been part of mine also she speaks fluent italian i took italian lessons for a couple of years because i thought i ought to be able to keep up with her but i couldn't <laughs> <laughs> i love that all right let's talk about Pedro. now you mentioned earlier you do take vic to lawrence kansas for a weekend of 
what she thinks is watching her honorary godchild angela play in a women's college basketball game in lawrence kansas and how timely how timely is that right i know i thought i was thinking this morning that i was prescient i mean (laughs) angela doesn't score at the level of caitlin clark but still she's one of these breakthrough women and uh God, I love that NCAA tournament. It was so good. Yeah. So, and but you know, once she gets, once it gets to Lawrence, things go off the rails in a pretty spectacular way. There's a opioid drug overdose at a drug house, a murder, nefarious goings on at a hilltop construction site. Um, this is not the can Kansas that Toto and Dorothy went looking for. <laughs> but also, there's a big chunk of this book that deals with Kansas's pre and post Civil War history, and I was intrigued to learn that you have a PhD in history, and that although you're mostly, in my mind, associated with Chicago, you have family roots in Lawrence. Was this an aspect of history that you'd been wanting to write about? You know, we moved to Kansas. I was four years old. We moved there from upstate New York. And the 1950s was the whole kind of decade was the centennial of bleeding Kansas, the fight over whether Kansas would come into the Union as a free state or a slave state. We used to act out these these dramas in my, in my primary school because the anti-slavery women the slavers controlled access into Kansas territory through the Kansas River in, in Kansas City. And the anti-slavery women would sew bullets into their petticoats and smuggle ammunition into the anti-slavery forces. And when we arrived in Kansas, while well, my parents were waiting for the house to be ready to move into, we stayed in the hotel that had been the anti-slavery headquarters for the state. Wow. So that history was just part of how I... I grew up. Then I started reading very recently different aspects of that history, and they were not nearly as benign as as my kind of childhood gloss had had given them. And I I learned that um, uh, a lot there were. In Kansas, between the end of the Civil War and 1935, there was a lynching somewhere in the state every mm-hmm. week. And there were um, African Americans who were, had their property seized from them. There was a, a lot of ugly violence, rape, and leading up to lynchings. So um, the crime of stealing someone's property and getting away with it was kind of at the heart of what I wanted to write about. I, I, I don't, sexual violence is a horrific fact of life and it plays an ugly role in the world around us every day starting, well, never mind. let's not go down that road, (laughs) but it's not something that that I want to dwell on in my work. And I think a lot of times crime fiction treats it in a sort of pornographic titillating Mm. way. So I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to deal with that aspect of our history. And I thought I would focus on property losses and property issues. And then the characters just started coming to life for me, the historic characters and then their descendants in modern day Kansas. And I have this uh, grandmother granddaughter pair. The granddaughter is a school teacher. She gets fired. The school board claims that she's teaching woke fiction, uh, woke history <laughs> when all she really wants is her kids to explore their personal roots and where their families right. came from. So it, it kind of um, modern day stuff kind of crept in without my noticing it. <laughs> well, I love too that you struck a blow for local journalism. Yeah, you've got you've got yes. character. Is that Zoe? Zoe, yeah, Zoe. Yeah, who... I, and I think that's one of the one of our most serious problems as a country mm-hmm. is, is that we're we don't have local news. It's all controlled by big media companies. You don't know what's going on in your hometown. You don't know who's on the library board or the school board or who's what nobody's covering meetings and telling you what's going on and um 
So I Zoe is definitely coming back. I I'm sort of I'm Good news. working on a book that isn't in my series right now, but Zoe's going to get her own book next. Um, oh. Or she'll come to Chicago and work with VI on something. I love, oh, I love that. that. Awesome. Well, through the strong female characters in your novels, you definitely changed the narrative about women in fiction. Um, and you are at the forefront of a group of groundbreaking women mystery writers, including Sue Grafton, Marsha Muller, and Linda Burn, Linda Barnes. And through your advocacy for female novelists, you opened the doors for other writers. So, like me. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Um, so what I'd like to know is, was it a conscious choice at the start of your career to be an advocate and a standard bearer like this? Um, in other words, did you set out to change the world or did no. that just sort of happen as your career evolved? <laughs> oh, gosh, I don't know. I think um, one thing that VI and I have in common is limited impulse control. <laughs> <laughs> and um, <laughs> Stu and, Sue Grafton and I published our first books in the same year, 1982. And we both got a lot of Neither of us had big sales then, but we both got a lot of review attention, which in hindsight, I think it's because we had private eyes and that was seen as more kind of right. masculine. But I was on I was on a panel, Hunter College put on the first national conference on women in the mystery in March of 1986. And as I took part in that, and I was a newbie then, so I was on panels with people like Mary Higgins Clark and Dorothy Salisbury Davis and, you know, women who'd been writing for a long time. Um, and I started hearing about how hard it was for women to get their books reviewed uh, in in the kind of publications that libraries pay attention to. And it was really out of that that Sisters in Crime evolved because I started reaching out to, I didn't know a lot of, a lot of these women on either coast, but I started reaching out and started hearing more. And so at the big national crime conference, the BoucherCon, that was held in Baltimore in, in 1986, I organized a breakfast to see, you know, it's like, okay, there's a lot of, of feeling that we're not getting a fair shake. Ooh. Do we have the energy to organize? If we don't, then we need to just suck it up. But the 26 women who came were, were definitely all for organizing. So, you know, the great civil rights lawyer, Flo Kennedy, she would say, don't agonize, organize. And, uh, and Sisters in Crime grew out of that. And then, you know, the other stuff, I don't know. My mother's father was a small town doctor and he died at the age of 50. He was he had just had surgery himself and then one of his elderly patients had slipped and fallen on the ice outside his home. Uh, and so my grandfather went out to help him to his feet and get him home and died the next day himself of a heart attack because mm -hmm. he was out post-op. And my other grandparents met walking a picket line for the garment workers union. So I guess wow. I just grew up with you. Um, you don't sit on your butt if something needs doing. Love you know, that. I love how you champion other women. I noticed an Easter egg in pay dirt <laughs> for one of your, for one of your uh, fellow Chicago crime writers, Lori Raider Day. And I got a huge I, kick out of seeing that. Yeah. Lori's great. So it was yes. she is great. definitely fun to include her, however, briefly. <laughs> and now you gave us a little bit of a, a, a hint about what you're working on next. Can you spill any more beans than that about what, what VI is up to? So VI VI really takes a beating in pay dirt. I mean, I, it's, <laughs> it's both psychological and, and physical and everything works out okay in the end with her and Peter, her current lover, but she thinks he's abandoned her and then she's in this town. She's beaten up. She's almost killed in this big old coal uh, power plant. Um, she needs a break. So she's on the island of Sardinia right now at a um, spa that, um, uh, and she's just pulling herself back together. I think she may go spend some time with Peter in Spain on the archaeological dig he's working on. And so I've created a new character. Her name is Lily. 
She's a retired CIA agent, and the CIA is trying to kill her because she's revealing more than they think she should about one of the posts that she worked at for them. So I've written about 20,000 words. My books run to about 100,000. So I have a ways to go, but that's what I'm working on. That's so exciting. I love it. Awesome. Well, I think you're about to head on, out on a, a, a bit of a book tour, right? I am. It'll be a small tour in the Midwest, but it, it, I'm going down to Kansas. The Kansas Lawrence, Kansas Police Department could not have been more generous oh, good. to me I love for their that. time and telling me how they work. And I'm thinking, oh, I didn't treat them well in, in exchange. <laughs> so I'm hoping that nobody comes and snarls at me while I'm doing my event. <laughs> well, can you give our audience um, a little bit of... Um info about where they might be able to meet up with you on the road and then also where they can connect with you online in the coming weeks? Yes, my website, sarahparetsky.com, shows all of the stores that where I'm going to be signing. And anyone who wants a personalized book, any store on this tour will be glad to get me to sign it for you and mail it to you. So the fact that I can't be everywhere much as I would, I would love to be everywhere, yeah. but I can't. <laughs> Um, but I'm happy to sign books for, for people uh, and stores are very happy to, to help get them into your hands. Love it. We love our indie booksellers out there. Definitely. Sarah, thanks so much for being such a great guest today. And we hope everybody, Thank you both. oh, it's our pleasure. Our and pleasure. All, of you, all of you watching and listening, will go out and grab your copies of pay dirt. Here it is again. <laughs> <laughs> One place you can do that is at the friends and fiction shop on bookshop.org where your purchases support our shows and our beloved indie bookstores nationwide yeah and all of you out there don't forget to tune in every wednesday night here on facebook and youtube for brand new longer format content about the books authors and the reading and writing worlds you can find everything out about friends the friends and fiction universe from the live show to the podcast the newsletter in-person events, information about how to purchase our guest books, to updates from the Friends in Fiction official book club, all on our website at friendsandfiction.com. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time.